Hey guys, it's Brian Nett from HowRadiologyWorks.com and I'm talking to you today telling you we basically need to wake up from the way that we've been doing gonad shielding for years as radiologic technologists and as physicists in charge of the diagnostic x-ray equipment. We now know that the shielding itself, the gonad shielding itself, actually is doing more harm than good for the diagnostic images. And this is Brian Nett from HowRadiologyWorks.com. We at HowRadiologyWorks.com, along with the AAPM, believe that we need to reduce the use of gonad shielding significantly in order to do the best for our patients. So we're going to be going over five reasons why we believe gonad shielding will be coming extinct in the near future, and why you as a technologist are really in the best position to help with education materials for upcoming technologists, as, long, as well as education materials for the patients themselves. Coming up. What we do here is we have bite-sized content about concepts in radiology. And the one we're gonna talk about today is gonad shielding, the motivations for gonad shielding, and why we believe that Given the fact that there's been a lot of progress in the technology of x-ray and some of the motivations for gonad shielding, we believe that probably if you're just starting out as a technologist now, it's something that's going to be important to learn because it's really part of standard of care today. But we believe it's going to be phasing out more and more, and you probably won't be doing it by the time you retire. So just again, at How Radiology Works, Dot com. We have bite-sized content of videos on YouTube here, so click below on subscribe and then click that little bell icon if you want to get notified when we release new content. So the motivation for gonad shielding is to reduce the radiation dose to the ovaries and the testes, and the radiation dose to the ovaries and the testes we would like to be low because there are some separate risks of radiation dose to the ovaries and the testes other than the cancer induction risk which we have with radiation throughout the body. So those separate risks to the ovaries and the testes are reduced fertility or sterility and that requires radiation doses about multiple gray for Reduce for sterility and a, a significant fraction of a gray for reduced fertility. And so those doses are much higher than the radiation dose of a diagnostic exam. So there's no chance of that. So the motivation really is the theoretical possibility of hereditary effects. But we know from Bear 5 and Bear 7, when there's been committees of individuals, they've made statements that we don't have any documented, clear cases of hereditary effects on humans. So all of our hereditary modeling is based on mice and then assumptions from humans. So that's, that's where we stand as far as motivations for gonad shielding. And it was introduced into the U.S. Code in 1976, so more than 40 years ago, even before I was born, actually. So, in the early X-ray equipment, there actually could be significant stray radiation dose from all focal radiation and such. So that stray radiation dose, if your field of view that you'd like to see is here, then there's this additional region right here on the top and the bottom, on the sides, that had a significant stray radiation dose. So that was a motivation for ha having a reason to block outside of the field of view, and you could do so with a gonad shield. So for blocking outside of the field of view, you could reduce radiation dose. However, now on modern X-ray systems, there's very low radiation outside of the primary field of view, so having a gonad shield outside of the field of view to reduce the primary radiation 
from stray radiation is no longer a significant benefit. Then the other question is, if you're using that gonad shield outside of the field of view, if it's not going to reduce radiation dose coming primarily, is it going to do anything for the radiation dose coming from the scatter from the patient? And the answer obviously here is no, because the primary, these photons shown in green that are coming in, those are the same whether or not you have the gonad shield or not, since the gonad shield's outside of the field of view. So most of the radiation dose to the patient in the gonads will actually be coming from scatter within the patient. So just as a takeaway, this gonad shield is not going to be effective for reducing dose from scatter from within the patient. So this is a reason why having a gonad shield outside of the field of view is not very effective at reducing radiation dose. Then shielding can also be designed to block primary radiation. So rather than trying to block stray radiation outside of the beam, you can put the shield actually within the primary beam path. So here's an example here where we're blocking radiation within the primary beam path. So this is effective at reducing the radiation dose. But one thing we do want to point out is that radiation dose, even within the primary beam path, is very low in comparison with the hereditary risk radiation dose and also in comparison with the radiation doses at the time in which these ideas were being formulated to use gonad shields. So if you look in the late 1950s, the reported dose in the literature to the testes or to the ovaries was on the order of 2.5 or 1.2 milligray. That dose in 2012 is down to 0 0.06 milligray or 0 0.01 milligray. So radiation dose reductions of 98 and 99% compared with originally. So this means that these are very low radiation doses compared with when these ideas were being formulated. And also, again, comparing with the known doses to reduce sperm count of 250 milligray, this is orders of magnitude lower. And the known doses for sterility, this is also orders of magnitude lower. So there's also issues when blocking the primary radiation. And there's a couple issues here. One is if you have a gonad shield in the primary beam path, that gonad shield is going to be affecting the signal that's measured on the detector. And in modern systems, there's something called automatic exposure control which is using either signal on the detector or an ion chamber at the detector in order to assess if radiation is getting through that can be measured. And it's going to increase the parameters used on the detector when the parameters are not sufficient for radiation in order to have good image contrast. So what's going to happen is if you have something in that, such as a gonad shield, that's really reducing the x-rays which can penetrate, it's going to increase the radiation dose for the whole exam, which is counter to the idea of reducing the radiation dose. So the second problem here is really reduced visualization of some key structures. So if you <laughs> want to have clear visualization of all the structures, then you have to have really great positioning of your gonad shield. And if you don't have great positioning of your gonad shield, then you're going to have some structures, for instance, in the pelvis behind the gonad shield, which cannot be visualized. So you'll either have to repeat the exam, or if you don't repeat the exam, then the radiologist is going to have to kind of do some interpolation within their head to try and assess what actually can't be seen perfectly well. So in summary, the goals of gonad shielding are to reduce the hereditary impact, and gonad shielding was put into the code of regulations over 40 years ago. Modern x-ray equipment has significant reduction in both the stray radiation that we talked about, 
and the primary radiation, so the dose actually to the gonads is on the order of 1 or 2% of what it was in the 1950s, at the end of the 1950s. So there's reduced reason for needing the gonad shielding. And then gonad shielding also can cause issues in terms of automatic exposure control, actually leading to more dose in the exam and potentially not getting all of the image quality in terms of being able to visualize all the anatomy of interest. So thanks for sticking around to the end. Really appreciate your time today. Again, I've been Brian Nett with HowardAlgeWorks.com. If you're interested in other educational materials, we have a website you can stop on over and also click subscribe below on this channel and um, to get notified when we release new content. And then check out the next video we have on radiation dose units. That's something you're definitely gonna be interested in with this topic.